Hi. My name is Al Ruscio. I'm a professional actor. I say professional because I earn my living by acting. Because I think I'm good at it. Because I work damn hard being good at it. Oh, I don't get paid as much as uh, Robert Redford does. But then, as you can see, I'm much better looking. In a minute, we're going to see a movie about another kind of professional. A professional team of auto racers. Now, you won't recognize their names like you and me. They're not famous. They're not stars yet. They don't win many races, and they don't get rich trying. But they do try. They try as hard or harder than anyone else. The team reaches for excellence in preparing the cars and qualifying it and the pit work in driving it. And they run their cars against such people as uh, David Pearson, Richard Petty, Bobby Allison. In that league, you have to have your stuff together, your head on straight, a professional attitude. And we can all learn something from men like this, something about ourselves. We can all learn something of what it is to be a professional. My name is Junior Don Levy. I'm the car owner and crew chief on a 76 Ford car number 90. We run the Grand National Circuit with NASCAR. Our driver is Dick Brooks, and our crew is made up of a right front tire man who's Kenneth Bell. We can get in and out just very consistently under 20 seconds. And, uh, it gives you a good feeling and really help Dick out too. I know when we muck up in the pits, we let the driver down. A jack man who's Leonard Tony. I'm a machinist by trade. And I make all the little parts like the pullers and bushings and things like that. During the race, I'm the jack man. Richard Donlevy is on the right tire. The pitch is just as important as the uh, as the driver taking the car around the track. It is. If you ain't got a good pit crew, then you're not going to win a race. Ain't no way. Unless everybody else just falls dead. The man that carries the tires to the uh, tire men, his name is Bill Rebel. Our gas men are made up of Robert Morris. We have to uh, get the cans up on the wall, and then up on the shoulder, ready to go in. And then we have to watch each other. If one pulls out, the other one has to go right behind. And Dave Bowling. We also have a man who catches the gas uh, for any spillage. His name is Vernon Carter. My nickname is Fla. When I'm 17 years old, I'm still in school. We have a man that catches, uh, cleans the windshield and gives the driver a drink of water. His name is Howard Pincheski. We just like to finish and finish good, but we'd like to win one. <laughs> Everybody wants to win one. In the pits, we have to keep track of all the laps that we make, so we have a scorekeeper, and his name is Russell Page. Time in the pit stops, they like to know what they're doing, because the next time, maybe they can shave a couple, point, uh, a couple seconds off or something. It makes a big difference. That makes up the entire pit crew for when we make the pit stops, on all the races. Dick Brooks is our driver. You spend uh, 80 miles or 100 miles of gas stop trying to catch up with somebody and you catch up with them and you come in and they have a two or three second stop faster than you do. And they just, uh, it just seems like the whole thing goes away. So you got to go out and you do it again. And it's, it, it's pit, a good pit stop is very important. You'll get uh, 20, 22 gallons of gas and two tires and uh, uh, hopefully in 15, 16 seconds. We found out that together, we could all form a pretty good team. But uh, individually, we, we didn't have a whole lot going for it. So that's the reason we all banded together. And, and we've been pretty much of a success in that type of racing. When you run against Petties and Yarbers and Woods, and have a lot of money behind them, it makes it pretty tough. But we feel like we've done a real good job with the guys coming in at night working and being at the racetrack on weekends and we have no paid members whatsoever. And all of the guys just enjoy the racing game. The other teams, they, uh, they haven't quite figured out what we've got yet because no, you know, it's no other team on the circuit that's made up like ours. But each one of these guys have, have stayed real late at night when we've had problems. And never once do they ever say, well, that's good enough. They always try to do it by them. I think these people are absolutely super because they do it for nothing. They enjoy it more, I guess, than most people do because they, they are, most of them pay their own expenses. And, they, and that makes me feel safe in the car because I think that probably by doing it that way, that they're, they're really serious about that if they put a piece on, it's going to be tight and it's not going to fall off.
the only thing I know we could do to it might help him a little bit would be tighten it up a little bit going in. But that thing going down a back stretch there kind of that, that's kind of spooky. I can't remember. We might have we might have popped the rocker on or something. On all the tracks that we run, we have a setup that we have to go with. And we keep a record of all the springs, the shocks, and the front end settings of all the tracks. Anytime that we make a change, we enter it in the book, and then the next race, if, we, if it didn't work, then we make a different change. And that way we try to keep abreast of the best way to get around the racetrack. short track is different from a mile track and a mile track is a little different from a mile and a half. So we have to try to get the car to go in the corner, not be loose, so the driver doesn't have the problem of having to get out of the throttle so he can make the best time he can. I've driven cars where a, a lady could have driven it, you know, and other cars to where it takes a lot of physical effort, where your hands will go to sleep, your fingers will get so tired that you can't you know, you can't hardly hold the wheels anymore. It just, uh, a lot of it depends on how well the car set up. Well, race morning, we get to the track, and I go out, and I swoop out the pits, and, uh, and we uh, get everything set up and make sure everything is working properly, all the wrenches, and uh, make sure everything is in about ready for the race. Then we bring the toolboxes out after we've gotten the car on the line. You want to feel like you did everything right and it's going to, ain't nothing going to happen on what you did. All the things in the pits are set up right. And you ain't going to have to worry about another guy that's coming up to you and say, we got to do this and this. position. She was asked one time on a, on a radio station, when did you really know that Dick wanted to race? And she said, well, I think when he was a little bitty boy, he used to go around pushing cars around in the dirt, going nud, 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 until all the veins popped out on his neck. He's probably wanted to do it all his life. When they have to start the engines and they start the parade lap, then you know then that all of the work that you put into it and I don't care how many times you hear it or see it, that is what it's all about. You're just waiting for that first lap. Any time that you go out on the racetrack, you have thousands of people that's looking at your automobile and looking at the type of work that you're doing. So anything that you do, even though you don't have a lot of money, as long as you do the best that you can, as you can, then you can do a good job and show them that you enjoy what you're doing. 
At the beginning of the race, we give the driver a look at their pit board, and that lets him know in just about where he's got to look in case we give him a message with the pit board. That's just to remind him to turn on the cooler for the rear end. Should duck down the pit road this time and clear the track for racing. That is pace car into the pit road. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all. Stand up, stop your feet, whistle, and clap your hands, and let's send them on their way. A beautiful array of Grand National Championship racing cars take the green flag and roof of estimate. And the four position car out front as they go down into the first turn. Buddy Baker runs by the four position holder. Baker has a hood out front going off the second turn. Dave Marcus comes charging back. Up and above that wheel to wheel, a lot of action down in the third turn. When the race starts, we check his time and we try to get him to set up a pace that's pretty close to what the leader's running within a half a second because a lot of times the leaders will jump out and run pretty gung-ho. But we know it's a 500 mile race, so we try to set, it, set our pace so that we can finish the race. pit crew should be very aware of everything that's happening on the track. The driver himself is just concerned with his own particular thing. To find if he's running in one groove, he needs to find another one if it's not fast enough. If it is the fastest, he wants to make sure not lose it. He should be able to know when the tire temperatures and stuff change or the track changes and stuff. But the pit crew should be aware of everybody on the racetrack. From the very beginning, I'll start to watch and keep track of the laps and the time of each lap. The time helps us determine whether the driver is getting tired, maybe slowing down a little bit, or how the condition of the tires are, maybe slipping or something like that. The laps that we keep is for gas purposes and tires. I did let him run out of gas one time in Atlanta. I never heard the end of it, but uh, when I tried to give that job to someone else, they didn't want it either. <laughs> I was clocking the leaders against Dick, and he was running real close to him in speed. Brooks was turning with about 130 miles an hour, somewhere along the way. Most of the time, uh, Brooks and I will talk about how the car is handling and whether he needs chassis change on the first pit stop. And, and we'll also check and see how the tires are wearing by when the competitors stop. Dick Brooks riding his track high wide and handsome, riding right against the guardrail now. Dick Brooks amazes me the way he keeps riding that fourth turn. That boy's riding within six inches of the wall. And At Rockingham, the asphalt is kind of worn away and left quite a few rocks sticking up. Down inside, that's the quickest way to go, but uh, most of the time it wears the tires out too quick. You will uh, most of the time have to change tires about 70 miles. Well, if you run up top, you can get by pretty close to 80 and 90 miles. So we go for the little extra distance. We'll use approximately 20 to 24 tires if we're careful. Cost of the tires run pretty close to $100 a piece. So you have to be as careful as you can because the more you spend, the less you make. that we have a radio is to let him know whether it's a caution flag out or whether it's a big wreck on the back stretch that he can't see and then I let him know and then when it's time to make a pit stop.
Pearson, Dal Walton, Richard Brooks, Jackie Rogers, Benny Parsons, Buddy, but everybody. David Pearson gets out. Richard Brady comes by. Good stop there. Tom. Everything went off. Uh, Richard had real trouble with one lug nut hanging in his socket, but uh, he overcame that and we still had a 21 second pit stop. Let's say six seconds on the track, it'd be all the way down that front straightaway. Or if you got a crew that can, uh, that can do a pit stop, two tires and gas in 15, 16 seconds, and the other crew has a little bit of a problem, just any kind of problem that knocks them back to about 22, 23 seconds. Then you'd have picked up that whole straightaway right there, right there in the pitch. We just changed the right side tires uh, 15 or 20 laps before. So on this caution, we were going to change the left side. Coming down pit road, he told me that he had had a little problem with the right side. So the crew was all ready to make a left side tire change, and I had to change them real quick. And then when they went around to change the right side, we noticed that the left side was pretty bad, so we made a four tire pit stop. If there's an emergency uh, there, then they react to it as fast as they can without a lot of fumbling around. So the whole lot of time we change uh, our minds during the pit stop. On a function like this, every man and everything he does affects the other five men on this crew. If you have any problems, you know, it just throws your timing all off. They did a test on me and I lost nine pounds. Well, that's all liquids. You dehydrate a lot. Some of the guys lost as much as 12 pounds. At Rockingham last year, it was so cold, you know, you'd ride around the racetrack under the caution flag with your hands between your legs trying to keep them warm, you know. And at about 400 miles, I had to go, I, we had a radio in the car and I hollered at Junior and I said, Junior, I got to go so bad I'm about to die. Man. He said, go ahead. <laughs> He just thought that he had passed the car and he pulled up on him and maybe the car had gotten off the turn a little bit better than he did. Uh, you gotta be very aware of that, that you're not not cutting the guy too short because some guys just won't lift and let you go, you know, and some of them all kind of hold you tight. As everybody is anxious and on a restart from a caution, you have all the cars bunched up and if one car makes one slight error, then that causes something that happened to Allison. 
When they uh, took Allison out of the automobile, other than being sh uh, shooken up and bruised up a little bit, he was ready to go home. Like at Talladega, we did lose a cup. Brooks was running second right with, uh, with Baker, and he was as fast as anything on the track. But we demolished the car. And one of them tried to get in a little too quick and kind of touched it in the rear quarter panel and got me a little bit sideways, and when it did, the car just started flying. And I can remember saying to myself, my God, this is going to be bad. All I know is when it gets up in the air like that, it gets kind of quiet and lonesome. And I clocked him just at 185 in that turn before he, he wrecked it. It took a lot of people to put the thing back together again, but we all took pride in getting it back. Not just getting it back, but getting it so it looked like it never been wrecked. If you look at uh, the car out there now, we're, we're running it. But the same crew that we have right now came over and worked night and day and had the car ready for Dover, which was only about a month later. And Brooks ran second with the same car. You couldn't hire the crew that we have for 100000 a year for the amount of work that they did. We've had no mechanical problems over the last three years. Not one thing has ever fallen off that animal. Chief tells you when the car is coming in, you know, and you go back in, you pick up that 10 gallon can of gas, which weighs about 80 or 90 pounds, throw it up on your shoulder and get that set on the side of the wall, wait for the car to come in. And when it comes in, you jump over and try to hit that little old bitty hole. That way you, you've got like uh, 15 seconds to put 20 gallons of gas in. Uh, oil on the windshield caused us to lose a race. I mean, we could have won first race at Talladega. One of the cars was throwing a lot of oil. Uh, and. Brooks's windshield was pretty well covered and he came in for a pit stop, couldn't see it at the windshield. It made the pit stop slower, you know. Uh, our stop was quick, but his approach was slow. a little bit and it just it kind of takes what sap there is in it and I guess you know after 350 or 400 laps in a race you're getting kind of tired. Brooks came on the radio and told us that we dropped a cylinder and we were trying to wait until until a caution flag came out so we could check and see whether the plug wire had come off or what had happened. lost two cylinders and we just were checking to make sure all the spark plug wires were on and we had planned to change the two spark plugs, which we did. 
but when we stopped the engine and tried to restart it, it locked up. You dropped the valve, you just have to do the best you can. All right, put the plug wire back on it. I don't think he can go anyway. It looked like it's dropped the valve. At the time, I didn't know what had happened, really. You know, I hadn't really thought about a valve. Jay started putting the hood down and, and st started shoving it back so quick. It's kind of a man you've spent all day, you know, and it's, now it's all over. But you got to take it in stride because if you get mad and everything, you just look forward to the next race and keep your enthusiasm up. You've got to take pride in what you do, uh, pride in the workmanship that you put into it. You can tell the way a man does his job, whether he takes pride in putting the wheel on or getting the exhaust pipes fitting to where they don't hit the floorboard and cause a vibration. Anything that he does, if he does the best he can. My dad had told me a long time ago, he said, son, if anything is worth doing at all, it's worth doing right. And if you can't put all of everything you got into anything that you do, you just as well not do it. The record books will show that Junie Dunleavy and his crew and Dick Brooks did not win a race in early 1976. But in a very important way, they are winners every time. But whether you make a living with a wrench, with a pencil, behind a counter, in front of a camera, you can measure success by the quality of your effort, your attitude, your determination to do your very best. Just to reach for excellence is to achieve a certain measure of success. Vince Lombardi said it best. He said, the quality of a man's life is in direct proportion to his commitment to excellence regardless of his chosen field of endeavor. That's something to think about. That's something to live by.